Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, I'd first like to begin to, by acknowledging the traditional lands on which we, uh, where I'm speaking from, where the gallery sits on Karilpa Point, um, and acknowledge uh, the traditional owners um, and custodians of these lands, uh, in particular the Turrbal and Jagara people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend uh, the acknowledgement to First Nations peoples and lands where our participants uh, join from and represent. Uh, my name's Tarun Nagesh. I'm curatorial manager of Asian and Pacific art here at the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art. Um, you're watching a virtual talk held in conjunction with uh, the 10th Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art that we call APT um, at Quagoma. Um, and today's virtual talk is titled You're on Mute, Collaboration During COVID-19. This discussion focuses on many ways artists collaborate, um, how they work with other artists, organisations and with communities, uh, and to highlight some of the unique exchanges and practices that our participants, participants are engaged with in their regions, as well as how these have changed more recently as the context and the ways of working have confronted new changes and challenges. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be joined uh, by our, our panel speakers, um, Edith Amatunahi, uh, Kamruza Mansharin and Salma Jamal Admushum, uh, Rocky Kahigan and Yi Lan. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us. Um, we do have the benefit of these online discussions of, of reaching out to our friends and artists and colleagues um, and collaborators throughout the region. Um, and we've got a really quite a diverse uh, um, group of places you're all, um, zoo, uh, you're all uh, coming online from today. Um, so I thought I should just mention it. So we've all got a sense of that. Um, uh, Yi Ilan joining us from Kota Kinabalu in Sabah, Malaysia. Uh, Rocky Kahigan from La Trinidad in the Cordillera region in the Philippines. Uh, Shadin and Mushum from Takagaon in uh, Northern Bangladesh. And Edith from West Auckland, which is um, usually not considered such a far place away, but one we've been disconnected from as well for a very, very long time. So I thought I might start with um, Shadin and Mushum. Um, and uh, so Shadin, um, uh, a very experienced artist from Bangladesh who's shown all around the world, um, and Mushum, who you work very closely together on Gidri Bali Foundation of Arts, which was an organization you established 20 years ago in the northwest corner of Bangladesh. And it's become a place of enormous collaboration and creativity, now resulting in major works being shown around and around the world, but also alongside this is really developing local opportunities. Um, so Shadin Mushum, Gidri Borley was deliberately set up to develop opportunities in a local region and maintain several different kind of projects or goals. Um, can you tell us a bit about the ideas of developing starting Gidri Borley and, and how it evolved over more than 20 years now. So uh, it, it, the organization came about in 2001 by Shadin and his friends when, when they decided to organize a festival. So uh, in, the, in the village that, uh, I mean, it, it was the village that Shadin belonged to. He was born and raised in that village. So, uh, so the, the idea came about uh, to organizing a Santal festival. Santals are a indigenous community who are local to the village. So, uh, so during that time, I mean, it, it only focused on the festival and how uh, the segregated community can, uh, can uh, because I was not there when it was established. Okay. Uh, I just, I born there and I, I, I spent my younger age there and it's like that 
I'm playing with them, with the communities. When I am trying to cutting my route and going to, um, to cities like Takurgao town or Dhaka, it's like that I'm missing something and I don't know what's missing. After some time, I realized that I am missing my roots. Then I came, then I came back again in again in my mind that I have to connect with my communities. That's the point that I I I want to make something that when I can collaborate with the communities. That's the main point, and it's helping me like that. Uh, when uh, someone I visit in Shantiniketan, there's I saw that the Shantiniketan is the field where the all around the Shantal communities and in the, the university in the middle of the communities. And then I realized that it's also it can be happen something in my village also because lots of communities, different communities are living in, in surrounding with, with me and we can collaborate something that it can be connected anywhere. That's the reason maybe that we are trying to make the Dribali. And I think that's, a, that's, that's really interesting, Shadin, that I think you, um, you obviously saw the opportunities for your own practice in, in the big city, in, in Dhaka, I'm assuming. Um, as an artist, but that this thing was missing and you needed to take it back to the community and connect with the community. And I know that you, you both, uh, you know, you, you stimulate projects that the community kind of carries out themselves, but also bring other artists in to have exchanges with the communities. And then they sometimes develop into these projects that are shown internationally. Um, and remembering that Dakar as the art center is, you know, Takagan is almost as far away as you can get from the art center in Bangladesh, right? Um, so, I mean, when you're working with community, uh, whether it's um, for big exhibitions, international exhibitions, whether they're in Dhaka or whether they're in some other parts of the world, um, I mean, how do you think about the significance for that local community with that kind of that outreach? It's not so much just about developing opportunities locally, but also internationally in that exposure? Over time, <clears throat> the organization has uh, included a lot of, I mean, the whole village is now included in our organization. So it's, that, it's like the village is the organization. Everybody's a member, everybody's collaborating, everybody's participating. Uh, what happens is when we develop work inside the community in the village, we hold an exhibition in the uh, with large scale projects. We hold the, uh, an exhibition inside the village for the village audience, and uh, they invite uh, people from the other villages. So there's like a festival. But when it travels to uh, outside venues in the you know high uh, I mean <laughs> high art venues, so that's actually. Uh, so most of the people in the village are very uh, locally centered. I mean, uh, I think 70% uh, of them has never have never traveled to Taka even, not to the capital. So they don't actually, uh, I mean, we show them videos and uh, images, but they're kind of uh, lost. I mean, they're odd at first, but they don't care because they, they, they cannot actually, connect, but they, they can relate to the exhibition that they have organized. So uh, that's, that's for us, that's actually the most important uh, exhibition for us too. I mean, for the community, that's the, <laughs> so it's, and for Shadin mm -hmm. and me, because we are very privileged to be, to have the uh, education uh, outside uh, in, in the cities and we, can, we, we are connected globally. And through us, they are connected globally, the community members, but uh, it's, it's different. It's sometimes funny 
because they will laugh at uh, you know the the, the installations uh, seen in big galleries and they will say that it looks very good in here in, in the outside venues that we have organized so yeah <laughs> so it's, i think it's that's a good point thing. we should all laugh at our our installations in big galleries <laughs> maybe that brings us to the fibrous souls which um it was a project you showed one version of in at the Dhaka art summit um, and of kind of developing further for presentation in apt 10 um, and it's one that is very closely related to the community, stitching together this story of, of certain families of the community, um, but also working with them and really highlighting craft practices, local craft practices. Um, can you tell us specifically about this work and this collaboration and how it developed? It's, uh, it's like that, it's the uh, different communities living there in Balia and is that some people who we are is like is like called the Adibashi that were living here more than 300, 400 years. And some some communities are they are living like 50 years, 30 years, or 70 years. Is that like the, the the mixing the communities? That's the thing that I'm trying to find out what's happening. Is that that like Muslim communities are most of them they came from other areas like southern part of Bangladesh or some other like Assam and I'm trying to find out why it's happening and their language is different my language and their language is different the extent is different. Then I talk with them and it's, it's just digging out the history of leaving. Leaving the societies, they are not belonging together, but they are belonging. And what's happened that they have long history, it's like a painful history of them. They are traveling like years and years to settle their peacefully. Now, maybe they are peacefully living there, but why they are here? Then we found that is the main reason is, latest reason is the environmental crisis, the river erosion, and the before is that colonial history is the main part why we are together or not together. And that that and also, uh, also the how the craft uh, craft struggles with the community because the Muslim community based in the village they have all uh, their ancestors uh, I mean coming from Assam uh, it's all connected to the partition and jute production during the British colonial era and uh, how they migrated from Bangladesh to Assam back then because it was not Bangladesh then but then but it, the railways played a huge part in this migration. So when they were there, then partition happened. So they had to move back in. Then again, when they settled in the riverside, Brahmaputra, it, it, it the, I mean, uh, river erosion, you know, first them farther and farther to <clears throat> Tapuga, where interestingly, I mean, no major rivers are here. So, uh, so they're here, they're very happy. At, and the new generation don't actually connect with that history, but they carry the crafts. I mean, this this shika that this particular jute weaving, uh, hanging uh, baskets, it it traveled with them. It's not part of the indigenous communities in this village. It's specifically connected with the Muslim community who have traveled from outside here. So it the work actually connects all these things, how how local, I mean, how the craft have traveled and what caused that great migration. And uh, now that they're, I mean, the inhabitants, I mean, they're, they're native, they're, they're considered as natives at the village because it's been almost a hundred years now. So 
yeah, it, it, the work actually speaks of, it, it kind of, a, you know, puts all this thing together, looks disconnected, but connects, you know, weaves together. So everything. Um, and so I guess, you know, the whole idea has come from, has come from actually just your curiosity in finding where people in the community came from. Um, but I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to see that it's all made locally as well um, and, yeah. and displayed locally before it becomes something they can laugh at at a big, big gallery <laughs> on the other side of the world. Um, uh, Edith, uh, I might um, just turn to you because I think you similarly work with the community that is very close to you um, and really important to you. Um, and while they're the subjects in your works, uh, you've developed ways to invite them in as as co-creators, I guess, um, trying to giving them voice and giving them agency in doing so. Um, and this, I know, has been primarily focused through the medium of photography um, and specifically portraiture, um, which has been crucial to your work and an instrument to you. I think you can broker relationships with community through portraiture and photography. Um, could you tell us something a little bit about how you work with photography and what it means when collaborating with community? Yeah, Talifa all. Um, I got my training many years ago and uh, I dabbled in all the arts and by um, elimination, I realised I was only good <laughs> with a camera. Uh, I wanted to be a painter and... Uh, but I suppose what I realized is the stories that I was interested in telling could still be told with a camera. So I came to art school with a very clear idea of the kinds of stories I was um, not only interested in telling, but was surrounded by, um, lived with, uh, followed by. So I, um, I guess I came with that impetus. Uh, which naturally meant that my collaborators or my subjects, people in the photographs were my family, were people who were also part of the story. Uh, for example, we do night prayers, uh, evening prayers. We call it lotu. It's a Pacific tradition, perhaps. It was uh, something I remember doing as a kid, and I noticed that my husband's family did that very often, and I was like, oh... I could make a picture about that. Um, so often they are stories that I'm surrounded by that I might not even remember or recognize, but the people I work with know best how to tell the story. So um, I guess the community thing is about expertise. I'm looking for local expertise. I'm leaning on um, locals or family you know, people that uh, who know the subject better than I do to help me tell the story um, so that the community building happens because perhaps the end or one of my outcomes is to make a picture is to have a show and exhibition but the process of making together uh, is not only it's quite, it's crucial, I suppose, to the work. I can't really do it without the community's um, support. And um, I've been thinking about that because when you're younger, you start quite close to home and what you have access to. Uh, but as I've gotten older, I've sort of done the same thing. The community sort of changed, but really they, they are the same people that um, might be a neighborhood further down the coast, but it is it is quite a tactic um, that seems quite integral to my process. So um, I feel very like I, the artist before talked about privilege. It's a very privileged position. Uh, artists get to take uh, and embody in the community. So I, I often come um, with gifts. I feel like we are having a show together. Who wants to be in the show? I think it's, uh, yeah, 
that's what I come thinking about, I suppose, yeah. And do you think it was, I mean, was it always there for you when you started making art that you knew it was going to be something you're interested in, in collaborating on and spending time with community? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of ironic as well, because I guess photography is, can be a very direct, very mm. quick um, uh, uh, way of working. Mm. But actually, when you, as you talked about, when you work with community, it needs to be very slow. It needs to be yes. receptive. Look, I'm not that inventive, and the world is far more interesting than anything I can imagine, you know. So um, I know the situations that happen in front of me, that is far more interesting than, um, yeah, I, I always think I'm just not that imaginative. So I feel like it's necessary. Uh, to work this way uh, because the world is so interesting and it unfolds in front of me faster and better than um, what I can dream of or something, you know. Um, like the way people put fire alarm sirens on their cars and blast Celine Dion in the neighbourhoods. Like I just couldn't even dream that up and that is something I, um, I mean, it's partially about like being an observer and a participant and when you're involved in the brokering of the relationship and the conversation, but also when you need to step back and um, make something with that, direct something. So uh, it is a dance between the, um, the world and as it's happening and all the people in it and me. <laughs> so I had this idea that I would come to uh, Queensland in Brisbane and work with community or people I know, uh, but I couldn't. So I started to think about how to imagine connections um, of a kind of broadcast I'd like to make from my bubble here in, in Auckland and West Auckland. So I started to think about oh, what is interesting, what a what is connecting between us, the ocean? Um, what will people in, I don't know, North Queensland want to see when they come to Quagoma? Um, that's sort of strangely uh, interesting and bizarre, but also familiar. So I kind of thought about those things, but also very ordinary things like sitting in the car, going for a ride or playing PlayStation and the purple haze of the light or blowing bubbles in the park during sunset. Um, so these are kinds of images I tried to build up of a picture of a conversation I was having here or there. Uh, yeah, you know, over the, over the course of the pandemic, you know, think, rethinking about um, travel and how you might situate a practice elsewhere you start thinking mm. much differently about the local and what's around you um, so Rocky uh, your practice in the Philippines carries a strong aspect strong aspects of organizing and ga gathering together community um, drawing attention and visibility to art practices but also to create spaces of access I know you've called it before um, so you can talk about community issues as well um, beyond your own projects, uh, you have a lot of involvement with a few different groups and initiatives, um, including as Vice President of Axis Art Projects in Baguio, um, uh, and the involvement with Markets of Resistance, um, which create screenings, performances, art displays, um, uh, and artworks for Bata. Um, could you tell us a little bit about some of these activities, kind of beyond your own works, I guess? Uh, and what right. they strive for. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I didn't go to art school. Um, so being being part of these organizations throughout the years after school, after university was sort of like my training into the arts. So um, I've never really understood art. Um, it's very uncomfortable for me to understand, understand art within a gallery space. Um, so Access Art Project was spearheaded by Kawai and Digia and a lot of other artists here in Baguio City. Um, and Baguio City is sort of like a hub for 
many ethno-linguistic communities across the Cordillera, um, an educational hub, um, a trade hub, um, also was a, a former American hill station um, during the, the American colonial era. So um, Actus thought, thought of like um, um, putting up a space or, you know, and programming activities where um, we provide a neutral space for issues, um, community issues with, you know, with indigenous communities, um, rights issues, and then sort of like use this strange creature um, called contemporary art um, to sort of like understand that. Yes, yeah, so access to um, weird um, well, program projects um, within Baguio City and also across the Halsema Highway, which is like this a long road, um, the highest highway system in the Philippines that connects Bontoc, where I grew up, and Baguio City, and the communities along that highway. And this highway was built mainly um, um, initially to access the gold mines um, in, in our area. And then now it's also um, to, um, it's, it's mostly used to um, trade vegetables, supplying most of the northern Philippines. So um, with all of these things, Access wanted to um, try and understand the difficulties within this region and um, you know the changes mostly amongst this community. Um, yeah. The years later, we worked with Markets of Resistance, um, which was Angel Shaw's project. Angel Shaw is the curator and uh, a teacher um, from New York in the Philippines. Um, and then she worked with Access Art Project because she's been working with these uh, art over artists, senior artists here too in the 80s. Um, and then she thought about bringing her students from the Philippines Women's University in Manila and then bringing them up to collaborate and study and you know work with and understand collaborating with communities here. Um, and then it ended up with a, a, a trade barter exhibition in the city market where we um, rented stalls and then bartered artwork and stuff. So um, these projects are sort of like um, how, I under how I grew up with art. Yeah. So it's kind of been fundamental from the, yeah. your very entry point into art. Um, are, there, are there particular, are there, are there particular um, uh, things that come out of some of these activities that are most meaningful for you? Yes. Um, initially, uh, um, there was even a manifesto for Access Art Project, for example, to sort of like um, study access to contemporary art within communities. And then, of course, it becomes um, weird as, as, I, as I grew out of it and into it. Um, I would say the same rationale as um, how uh, the project worked out with um, Mushum and uh, and the uh, yeah and her group um, how you know they just laugh at these like strange um, installations and what you know um, and I think in the end um, it was all an experiment um, trying to understand how you know communities react to art and how that as a device um, is being used by NGOs and you know and government institutions to you know to work out their development agenda or whatever um, and um, if we kind of touch on um, a series of your works uh, um, that that uses the the loom and I think mm -hmm. um, I think you, these began with your collective memories exhibition in 2018 mm -hmm. um, which focused on collectivity as being at the heart of indigeneity I think I've heard you um, describe it as, or someone describe it. Um, could you explain where this body of work has come from and this aspect of collectivity that informs it? Right. Me growing up in Bontoc, um, beside the Bontoc Museum, and then, um, you know, as a young person at that time, my curiosity for objects began with that at the Bontoc Museum, I, I, you know, um, a vestige of um, 
colonial cabinet of curiosities, um, you know, thing. And so um, curios curio my curiosity with the cabinet of curiosities sort of was like an awkward relationship, looking at these objects and then seeing them in the, in the community. So look, you look at the, a woven um, fabric or a textile uh, in the museum and you're uh, suddenly estranged from it. And then you go out of the museum and then you see everyone wearing it. So moving forward, um, trying to study objects um, as, you know, um, these things that are, uh, if, sorry, um, these it's things okay. that, you know, um, represent a lot of these like collective this material culture thing represents a lot of these um i don't know i don't really like to use the word collective but this this like sort of communal relationship so you make you know, the process of production of an object is essential to how you understand it you know like when people go to the rice fields and then um collect rice it's always a group activity um yeah so um coming up with collective memories it was more a reaction to that. And it's, like, I mean, yeah. fundamentally, as you develop these heirloom pieces, you work with a lot of, a lot of people, right? And you mm. use materials that uh, are, are mm. communal kind of spaces and. Um, yes, it was, it, it was very tongue in cheek, actually, like using hair, for example, for collective memories and gathering hair from one top, you know, just you know, to make a point that this is indigenous DNA. Mm. Yeah. yeah, no, But it you. was also difficult because um, I feel like the work that I've been doing with Axis and, and Markets of Resistance aren't meant to be for museums or galleries. And then suddenly I'm like at the point in, in doing work for galleries where how do I get this in? Would it be difficult? Would it be, you know, and then I'm supposed to sell them, you know, so it, it became very interesting. And then I just went through with it just to understand where, you know, where to position the whole idea, uh, position myself within that whole idea. At least. Mm, no, I think that's, I think there are some interesting questions that I think you all of you navigate <laughs> in your practices as well. Um, so Ilan, um, and as with Rocky, many of your collaborations and activities with communities and advocacy work um, has been about exploring your own identity, I think. Um, you also have a longer history working in Australia and um, showing work at APT, um, quite different work than you're uh, working on um, now and the collaborations for APT 10. Um, so, I mean, is it fair to say that there was a, a bit of a shift in your practice? And I know you moved um, back to Sabah and started working with um, artists and groups there. Um, uh, do you, can you tell us a little bit about that return and, and, you know, how you started really kind of working very closely with some of those different groups in Sabah? Um. When I first showed with APT was APT3 in 1999. And I was so excited at the time. It was my first big show. Um, but I, on hindsight, I was way too young. But even, even with that early work, it was, a, it was called Malaysian Vintage. And it's this, I mean, I'm terribly embarrassed about that work now, but it's a, 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 it was looking at the way that through colonial history, uh, Malaysian society had been divided into these census friendly categories of Malay, Chinese, Indian, and everybody else was the others. And I was most definitely in the others, one, because I was mixed, and two, because I come from the Borneo side of Malaysia, which, which doesn't register on um, uh, cultural, pop culture, media, um, all forms of, of um, uh, documentation of, of, of what an imagined community may be. There is an absence of the Saban Sarawak Borneo states in the, in the wider Malaysian landscape, uh, whether it be literature history or visual art history, dance history. We've never had to this day a cinema film 
released in Malaysian cinemas that was made by uh, Bonian Malaysians. So we still don't have that film. So uh, this anxiety about claiming a kind of visibility or space um, has, has always been in my practice. And Rocky, I've been using hair too. Um, uh, and, uh, it's since university days, precisely for, as, as you exactly said, is this, this um, trying to, using hair to talk about the individual identity, the, the inherited identities, you know, that, that at one point uh, is a little bit of a joke, on the other hand is damn serious, you know, it's forensic, you know, um, but I get sidetracked. Um, Yes, so all of this anxiety has driven much of my practice, which has been about, if I could sum it down, has very simply been about understanding power and understanding who gets power and how is power used, how is power shared, uh, crossing over into sort of political realms. And the, the way I understand politics is how communities and societies organize themselves. It's as simple as that. Um, so I've been practicing in KL in my stubborn Malaysian Borneo way for something like 25 years. And then in 2018, we had, I mean, this is very personal also in terms of a personal journey. We had a very important general election, the 14th Malaysian general election. And um, it became a very, very, Kuala Lumpur became very toxic at the time. Airplane. I love airplanes now. A rarity. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in the, my studio is right below the flight, flight path and it was so quiet for two years. So now I celebrate the sound of airplanes. Um, so anyway, uh, 2018 was toxic KL and, uh, and the Borneo states were near invisible. Uh, well, they were given a lot of importance, but for, for political expediency, not for any real true engagement or understanding. So I decided that's it, that's enough, I'm, I'm going home. And I was also ill at the time. And when I went home, uh, like Shadin mentioned earlier about this need to find your community, I realized that I'd, because I'd been away for so long, I kind of lost my home identity, although I'm always back every few months but I wasn't living there. And there's a difference when you move to live somewhere, you know, and, and commit that way. So I've been working with weavers in uh, land-based interior and also sea-based communities for this past four, five, four years or so. And it started because of this need to find my hair, my community, uh, my 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 people in a way I'd, I'd lost it and I'd come from a very toxic environment where it was so loud and I couldn't think anymore um, so it was really slowing down a lot this is 2018 and I started by because a lot of my my previous practice was based on photographic works and looking at archives and unpacking and reading archives so I'm interested in photography as an object that can be read um, as a document that, that traverses quite a quite a important period of our human uh, knowledge, which is relatively recent, uh, inclusive of the colonial period. And then I sort of continued that, that habit, if you like, of trying to find entry points through photographs. And I found these old family photographs, which I love very much, uh, when I was about four or five years old um, at my grandmother's, uh, village called Nambazan in Pinampang. And she's a Kadazan woman, Kadazan community. And um, it was a harvest, harvest festival uh, Magawal rituals. And these rituals were all held on these mats, plain mats, unembellished, very ordinary looking, nothing special. And then I had this memory. I think my grandmother used to weave mats. And I remember my grand, and she passed away when I had already graduated university. I was in my twenties. So I was already an adult when she passed. But then I was suddenly remembering my grandma and talking to my father about her weaving. And what really triggered me was um, 
my grandmother used in those photographs the bundusan mats, meaning they're made from this reed called bundusan. Now, as as a Sabahan person, um, I we have a major highway road called Jalan Bundusan. It's a it's a big connecting road with the the area that my grandmother's village was in, which is 20 minutes from the capital of Sabah. So it's very urban, it's now become very urban. It was one of the earliest communities to become urban, but we're kind of connected by this major road called Jalan Bundusan. And I knew it was a Kadazan Dusun name, but I never knew what it meant. And so it was a revelation for me that this road was named after this reed that the people of that area used to weave. And then I started by looking for the plant and I couldn't find the plant and I couldn't find anyone who was still weaving with that plant and had the knowledge of how to, how to treat that plant, how to prepare the technology that goes with preparing your raw material in order to do a, a weaving. And then you know, sort of compounded with all this political and power frustration and visibility and all of those issues, I was realizing linguistic issues, the, the, the knowledge that is lost with the, the loss of language. Um, um, I was realizing just how vital, urgent, desperate, so much of our storytelling had become. And in this process of wanting to find my community again, moving back home and to, to, to find community, this, this um, methodology, I suppose, of starting with something so basic, like a mat, like a platform that is taken for granted. Your, I always say to people, your, your parents made you on a mat. You know, you were born on a mat. You, you lived your life on a mat. And then when you were buried, your, 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 when, you, when you are buried, your body is wrapped in a mat, right? So it's, it's this entering, entering a kind of way to find community, politics, power, culture, knowledge, all of that, which just sounds so big, but it's so, so neatly um, exampled, I suppose, uh, for me via the mat and how to unpack this mat to, to, to ease out and pull out ways of talking about ourselves and discovering ourselves. And then the other thing that was a trigger, was a major trigger, well, also from colonial pre-colonial and colonial period, was this by design separation of the land people of Sabah and the sea people of Sabah uh, that, that dates to pre-colonial times with the Brunei and Sulu Sultanate tolling the rivers, uh, economic uh, movement from the land people to the trade uh, highways of the sea. And so this animosity uh, between the land people and the sea people predates even colonial period. And then the colonial period just exacerbated all of this. And then con uh, uh, again, contemporary politics exacerbated, uh, exacerbates it again in order to kind of uh, weaken the, the Sabahan voice in answer to federal politics. So a lot of my work is driven by bringing people to the mat, the land people and the sea people in order to, to get to know each other on a very deeply personal level by the woman, by the domestic space, by the families. Um, so these, this, this idea of the mat and this, this idea of the land and sea community sharing the mat um, and also the market because the market was our natural habitat where the land people and the sea people would meet. So the, the people from the hills would meet, the people from the rivers would meet, people from the plains would meet people at the sea. Um, this is kind of the natural social equilibrium, if you like. So if you're sea people, you, you want the other, you want the people who sell rice from the plains. And if you're from the plains, you want the sea people because they sell you the salt that you, you must have in your diet. So, um, it's this, this idea of, the, of people meeting at the market. And to me, I slash museum, the market slash museum, as a, as a kind of meeting place where you look for somebody who's different from you, who has a different 
technology knowledge system from you and and how you get enriched through that that trade that barter that that exchange of um uh needing uh for your own health your own community needing the other rather than distinguishing the other for uh xenophobic type or negative uh uh overtones which is often the case here but to 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 re-recognize that we need the the others we want the other we, to recognize and celebrate something different and other from what from where we come from so in apt10 you collaborate really really closely with the dusun waivers um but also uh worked uh, for some time i understand and you know with some kind of purpose in mind with the bajau people could you tell us a little bit about you know how you've i mean some of your goals in working with those communities or some of the hurdles you've you've faced in 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 kind of bringing attention to their art practices and and trying to find opportunities for them um the end goal is to take the power back uh and and when i say take the power back i mean in terms of I hate the word empowerment, but it's a really powerful word. But I mean empowerment, but uh, that's so cheesy. Uh, I mean uh, a political power, a self-confidence power, um, a power that we don't have in order to answer back to a federal center. So meaning in uh, West Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur and all that. Um, so that's end goal is to be able for Sabah's communities to come together Tana, tana means land, I means water, sea, compounded Tana I, it means homeland. Sabah has to find its homeland voice in order to answer back. So that to me personally is end goal. Um, but the, for example, the, you mentioned the Bajau community who are showing uh, their traditional uh, mats. They, they are showing, not under me, but uh, not under my uh, collaborative work, but completely independent from me. They're showing their mats with uh, APT. Um, that's a, a, a stateless community. Um, they don't have paper identity, but they have an extraordinarily rich cultural identity. And in many ways, to me, they represent ASEAN. They represent Mafalindo. They are Malaysian, Filipino, and Indonesian. Our border that we have uh, separate the Malaysian border was from 1963, so that's 50 something years old, under 60 years. So within living memory, there's this border that's, uh, that's um, separated people. But this Bajau community is a, is a mobile fluid community across the corridors of the seas of the Southeast Asian uh, island archipelago. So to me, they are, they are, they are, really, really Southeast Asian, number one, or archipelago Southeast Asian. And within the, the mats that they have, uh, including the ones, the, the, the six, I think, that you're showing at APT, you will find that the, the, the mats are multi-generational in that they're, they're inherited knowledge from uh, ancestor knowledge, Nenek Moyang, they say in Malay. And they're also fascinatingly multilingual in that they share uh, motives and reading patterns, counting patterns, uh, rhythms with um, uh, seafaring cultures across the region of Southeast Asia. Um, and so, they, so these maps, people talk about Southeast Asia not having um, sort of uh, written language other than the Batak of Sumatra and the Bugis navigational maps. But I always think that actually we do have a uh, uh, literate written language via motifs that can be read uh, cross generations and cross communities uh, because they're shared at the marketplace. You know, you know what you're buying, we're bartering for. So you will see these um, interrelated uh, languages uh, through things like motifs and making pattern styles, counting rhythms through the Pandano sweep, which may stretch as far as uh, Australia and New Zealand, I'm not sure. I know that we share many Satu Dua Diga Lima, I think, uh, in terms of Maori language, there's a lot of similarities. Um, so I want that to all take part in this big conversation about uh, the history of ideas and communication 
about who we are as Southeast Asians. Um, and so the other agenda is to start paying, along with all of you, um, to, to, to pay attention to these um, other trajectories, this other sort of very, very laden world of knowledge that, that um, sometimes is not given the power or the power is not recognized. And I want to recognize the power and I want, I want to take the power back or to, to, to include the power. Moving on from there, we're also really interested to discuss some of the changes that we've all faced um, over the past year or two during the pandemic. And so I thought, Edith, I might come back to you. You did touch on this a little bit, but I thought your work actually did quite dramatically shift from the original idea you had for APT um, uh, to what you ended up with. And you started talking about this, this, this change to the local um, I was wondering if maybe you wanted to expand a little bit about that um, or if you've had to really rethink about your practice um, in other ways. I'm not complaining as an artist. We get, live a good life, I think, a lot of the times. We get to connect to parts of the world that um, we might not have seen or, or make connections to people we may not have ever made connections to without the vehicle of art. But often, um, sometimes I feel like I, I try to promise a community. <laughs> um, I try to promise a response with the community and guarantee that this audience is going to show up to the gallery. Uh, and that's hard going <laughs> when you keep promising that promise. But, oh, yeah, I'll go to Australia and work with the Samoans I know there and the Samoans I know in Alaska. And... Um, 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 you know, part of it is really wanting to make work with your people because that is, um, for lots of ways, you honour that process and the people uh, stories and all of that. But also, it's quite stressful um, to to show up into a new city and a new place and uh, think that you can make anything good in what two years or whatever that you're supposed to make some new work and uh, because you've been invited by uh, say this quag goma for APT so in some ways the world closing down really forced us all to consider or reconsider how we make connections <laughs> how we make art and uh, I kind of had a sigh of relief I was like okay so we're not going to Australia and uh, I really had to address trying to think about another place while making the work here, you know, and um, uh, knowing very well, I always um, consider an audience. I'm obsessed with audiences, an imagined audience, who's coming to see the show, who, who are you making the work for? who's in the work and who's going to connect to that. So um, that was very much in my mind when I was trying to make, uh, when I was making the work, like, okay, who's coming to Brisbane Gallery? Who's coming in the train and riding and coming to see this work and what are they going to connect uh, to? What, what are they going to be familiar with? So um, in some ways that, that it helped me close down some possibilities that uh, I didn't need to address. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, Ilan and Shadina Mushum, I think uh, both of you, you know, working, I mean, through even just over the last year working on APT, you also have to travel to communities you collaborate with. Um, and, you know, some of them are remote and I know sometimes the internet is, is a bit unstable. Um, I know you also, you know, there's that real fear of that you might actually take um, coronavirus from the city to to um, uh, smaller places. Um, would either of you want to, um, any of you want to comment a little bit on that? You know, some of the hurdles. You, I mean, both still continued, all still continue to develop projects in these places. Well, uh, for us, it was, I mean, stra a strange uh, two years because it's, I mean, uh, because we have done uh, uh, projects in a new way, 
because uh, this is the first time we have uh, done so much online collaborations, uh, especially our kids group. We have a kids puppet group in the village. So they have collaborated in several projects with uh, other countries. Um, but uh, for, for us mainly, because we had to go to Dhaka for a couple of things. Of course, everything is centered around Dhaka. So anything official, anything, any important things, you need to go to Dhaka. So, uh, so we were in constant fear because Tarun knows because we were in correspondence. So it was so hard to move uh, uh, because it's, uh, we were scared that we will carry the virus to the village because it was, I mean, there was no cases, but Dhaka was the you know, most impacted city in Bangladesh. So, yeah. So, yeah, and, and for you, I think a couple of <laughs> Shadin's long-term projects that he was new plans, he had new projects, but he couldn't uh, do it because he needed to travel across the border to India for that, but the borders were closed. So. Before pandemic, I realized that I am running fast and I don't need to. And everything is what we are doing, it's nothing. And what, what the community thinking and what I'm thinking is the totally different. Then I realized they are better for me. They are better from us because they are living there. They don't mind what you are doing or not doing. And they're doing their livelihood. They are making crafts. They are uh, cultivating their lands. And we, the people who are from, came from the main town and we are thinking, no, no, you are not doing. You have to doing something special or something. That's the thing that I'm realizing that no, it's it's their right. Maybe some point I am not listening them or I am I'm not listening the knowledge of living. That's changing me. And nowadays I don't mind what's happening or not happening because. Is da is doesn't belong anywhere. What we are doing, we are doing for uh, for ourselves, not from others. I think it was like Edith was saying: you get that relief from not traveling, and you can actually concentrate with what's important. Actually, in the village, it never nothing ever stops because it's the, the main uh, source of uh, occupation. I mean, it's it's agriculture. So you you are going to cultivate your land three sixty five. Uh, of the year, uh, days of the year. So it's so it's very different from how we view them. So our outsider, uh, I mean, we we actually are outsiders and insiders at the same time. But during these two years, for for both of us, I think we learn to uh, separate. I mean, learn to uh, identify our outsider self. How we have this outsider lens to view them, <laughs> so this othering. So we are kind of, uh, I, I would say we are very enriched in that way because we have uh, moved very much forward personally. Uh, Ilan, do you think, I know you're talking about, you know, the marketplace, people coming together. Um, and I mean, as, as Shadim mentioned, so there are still these centers do you think it's 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 been harder um, in these restrictions for people that are um, uh, at a distance from the centres? Um, yes, uh, at least in Sabah it has been. Um, the two communities I work with, uh, they are both very very heavily reliant on tourism. Um, the inland Doson and Morot community produce huge amounts of the handicrafts that you would buy at the airport, for instance. Um, so when tourism stop, the orders stop and there's no income. The community I work with sell a lot of seafood uh, for like um, the tourist restaurant meals, um, uh, diving, diving tours and all the rest of it. So the whole economic structure based on tourism 
just didn't exist anymore. So for me, the first few months of COVID was, my mantra was rest is radical. So as I, you know, did very little, uh, I would justify it by saying rest is radical. And then during that time of thinking rest is radical, I was thinking about ideas of the circular economy, worried about these communities and how we could generate something. So ideas of this uh, circular economy of restorative and regenerative economy of how to make, as an artist, how do I participate in this? How do I generate economy? How do I keep things going for this difficult period of time? That's when I really start working towards the solo show at home in Sabah um, and to activate a massive amount of making uh, during the slow period in, in the communities where they were stopped. They didn't have their normal, usual handicraft making. So a lot of people are free, so they'll join my team. So let's make an exhibition worth of work during this time and try and keep an economy going, um, even to the point of doing things like replanting pandanos plants. Um, so the women who plant the pandanos plants would sell their product to the weavers. So there's this constant movement of uh, uh, economy, so to speak. Um, so that was a really fascinating for me. It changed my, it's changed my life really and changed the way I, I will be practicing as an artist henceforth to, to bear in mind the economy of art and how that can be an active participant. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is learning. Oh, the other thing that happened was because the wives, the mums are so busy weaving and the husbands are no longer selling their lobsters to the seafood restaurant. Uh, we had three uh, in the sea community where three of the husbands helped their wives with the weaving. And the husbands were starting to, as the women gathered at that Rosia's house to weave, the men were looking after the children at home. So there's a really interesting gender dynamic shift, which I found quite fascinating. Um, and then, uh, what was I going to, there was another thing. Oh, the technology aspect became really interesting on learning how to, because I also have a language problem with the uh, Bajau. I don't speak Bajau, but I speak Malay. So then um, uh, learning how to communicate via WhatsApp, uh, especially WhatsApp, um, uh, became a really big thing in the early days of, of, of communicating, because um, it's much harder to communicate when you have limited shared language via phone than it is face to face. Um, so working through that, expanding a team to include translation um, to make sure that people had their voices were part of the conversation has become a thing. Um, more so because we're distanced from each other um, and learning how to do Zoom. Um, As yeah. we all have. Yeah. Other impact that I see with the community is how the environment is taken up, has taken a break too. And I think it's worth remembering that it's mm. there's there's these positive aspects. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Rocky, um, you know, you're part of a, a really vibrant arts community in Baguio, La Trinidad, Cordillera yeah. region. And I know, you know, all of you work or many of you work so closely together on all yeah. kinds of things. Um, what's kind of the impact been for you? And do you see any, you know, like Yolan was saying, do you see any of these benefits um, that might continue into the future? It's been uh, difficult for us here in the Philippines because the pandemic hasn't really been managed that well. It's been lockdown after lockdown after lockdown until now. Um, we're one of two countries in the world who aren't open yet to face-to-face you know, a classroom education. So it's even now I haven't, you know, I mean, making the work for APT, I had to ask family to, you know, uh, go to the people I work with to get the hair and then, you know, and then I had all, I also had, I mean, I had planned this whole thing since last year. And then we almost changed the whole hair concept because it might not go through, you know, um, the restrictions uh, in Australia. So um, even that. So um, although 
luckily there is a community here of artists and we see each other from time to time um trying to understand where we're going what we need to do um but there really hasn't been much <laughs> done it's mostly been artists just locked up in their homes and studios and working because you know and then you know uh, it's just it's just been difficult i guess um but at least in the communities i know that some of the communities that like i guess in other in other communities um that was spoken about just now um uh, most of these communities are, you know, self-sufficient in terms of, you know, you know, uh, have mo they're also mostly agricultural communities up here, so there hasn't really been a problem. There's even this one community who uh, didn't, who denied their um, support from the government because they can manage on their own. So initially developed projects, most of them research projects, right before the pandemic, and now we don't know how to do it we can't like you know it's we can't do zoom um it's very impersonal also so um <laughs> eventually as things become easier we hope to go back to at least some semblance of a you know of, of a face-to-face -face kind of, of work or collaboration mm. uh, it's been a fabulous discussion i think uh, i think it's reminded me um, that, you know, that of the wonderful opportunity we've had that you are all working with um, communities and collaboration still throughout this time um, towards APT projects, but also in all the other activities you do. And I think it's, it's fabulous to hear you're all busy, all still doing projects, some really interesting new things. So I would like to say an enormous thank you for joining us um, and sharing your stories. Uh, Rocky, Ilan, Edith, uh, Shadin and Mashum, um, thank you very much and um, we hope to see you all in person sometime very soon.